and welcome to another edition of Proselytize or Apostatize. I'm your host, David Russell, and I don't have a co-host today. What's going on, you might ask? But no, we have an exciting show for you right now. Um, so before we get into that, though, I do want to announce the contest. So as you know, last week I announced that we are going to have a contest on who can make the best logo for PRAs because we're looking for a new logo and we might in the future look for a new name because proselytize or apostatize is a mouthful. Even N.T. Wright said that on uh, <laughs> on uh, Ask N.T. Wright everything. But uh, yeah, so tonight's a special night because as you know, David Paulman is actually leaving us. And you got a taste of it in the intro for May, and you got a little taste of it last week, as you saw Caleb Jackson hosting a debate between me and Cassiano Montoya or Montana. I can't remember how to pronounce his last name. Caleb had to pronounce it, which I was thankful for. But yeah, <clears throat> so yeah, that's, uh, that's what's happening there. So who is Caleb? Caleb is a guy that decided to come on the show to debate uh, our good friend, the honest atheist. And uh, they debated whether Christianity was true, and ever since then, Caleb has been an integral part of the show. Caleb has uh, uh, put together debates for us. He has worked behind the scenes in several different areas. There's actually two guys that really stuck out to me when David was like, hey, I got to leave because I'm moving. As you know, David is moving, uh, so that's why he has to uh, leave the podcast. So uh, I was like, dude, Caleb, you know, and he was like one of the first that came to my mind. And, and I was like, dude, this guy's helped us out so much. He has, you know, put together debates and, you know, that kind of saves our butt sometimes because sometimes, you know, we do get these periods where we're like, man, what what type of content do I put out? What, what do I do? So... Yeah, Caleb's been an integral part of that. So before I bring him on, I want you guys to get ready to either A, grill him, B, come on and just talk to him because we are going to ask Caleb a lot of questions tonight, uh, myself included, hopefully if I can remember some of them because I am winging it, guys. This is kind of like an episode of like, uh, like coffee cup apologetics or brew and talk or whatever it is you know you have a, a beer and, and and you talk about theology and stuff so yeah that's that, that's kind of what but without further ado uh i i cooked this up so this is going to be the new face of pra so without further ado here we go Awesome. Welcome, Caleb. Man, congratulations, brother. You are now officially a co-host of PRA. How does it feel, man? It feels great. I mean, I feel like I've kind of already been a, a signatory co-host for the past couple of months just because I've been helping out so much behind the scenes, as you uh, pointed out in the intro. Yeah, man. Yeah. And we're grateful for that, man. And, you know, it's it's there's nothing better to get, get somebody that like, you know, Instead of, you know, David was like, hey, let's let's look for a new co-host. And I was like, look for one. You know, and I was just thinking to myself, I was like, OK, man, uh, find somebody if you have to. And I was just going to leave it all on him. But at the end of the day, I, I sent him a, a, a text because, you know, he hadn't been responded to me. And we had plenty of time to, like, think about it and plan it out and stuff like that. I, I, I knew since, like, January this was going to happen. But, uh, yeah, I was like, dude. Caleb, you know, I, I just seen him. I said, we got to ask Caleb before we ask anybody. I would feel wrong if I didn't ask Caleb first because this guy has been 
in it, man. And he's he's been trying to promote this brand and this ministry for a long time. And and it, hey, look, somebody's already saying, hey, look at that, Jackson. But yes, yeah, so <laughs> and this one's actually a little disappointed, as you know, he was a former co-host as well. His name is Titus, oh, but we okay. don't listen to Mennonites here because they they like to stay secluded in their own uh, little communities. <laughs> oh, and Daniel Lowry says, "How's it going, heretics?" Hey guys, look, I'm gonna send send the link. You guys are more than welcome to come on, Caleb. You know, I what I did here was. I told them that they can grill you if they want or me and they can ask us questions or anything, you know, so, uh, yeah, so, but, you know, the first thing I want to do is, is welcome you and let you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and who you are, you know, what church you go to, your personal email, your blood type, all, all that type of stuff, man. Go ahead. All right. I'll do blood type first. I'm A positive, which is nice i mean jesus's blood type was a b positive but that's you know a letter down uh few people will get that joke but it's okay so, so yeah my name is caleb jackson as we've established cj is just right put there for short uh, i actually am going to graduate indiana university on monday so i'm done with school I'm me walking uh with degrees in political science and communications so that's nice and hopefully in the upcoming winter i will be able to do a paid internship with indiana state house where i'll work with senators and congressmen and all that fun stuff but in my free time as a hobby i do theology and apologetics which i just kind of got into about two and a half years ago or so and uh since then i've written two books as of now uh the first one's undead which is on the resurrection and actually has a different cover now but that's okay and my latest one is called searching for a solution to suffering which oh can't get in the camera is on the problem of evil and theodicy uh which is a topic that was just talked about on the show um, both of those are on Amazon, uh, and I'm currently working on a third one, which is by far my longest one that I've done so far. Um, I'm already at about 400 pages, and I'm probably not, I'm probably like two-thirds of the way done, so this could be a 600-page book or so by the time it's done. And that one is on a uh, contemporary miracles and visions of Jesus and supernatural phenomenon, let's say, and tying that back to the resurrection. So uh, I'm very excited for that. That will probably be out maybe this winter or next spring it depends on how long it's going to take but yeah that's kind of what's going on in my life right now and uh, i'm just glad to be here and i'm looking forward to all all these people who are in the chat uh, a lot of which i talk to a lot and have, we pretty much i've already grilled each other on various things so i'm sure that'll yeah. be fun but, yeah yeah it will be but caleb uh you know somebody just asked you know that you don't attend church. Is this true? <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm really kind of scared here. Who am I? Who am I bringing on here to host with me here? You know, oh, and then and Titus, he's a little worried too. He says we're going down the slipper slopes here. Oh, well, we've no. got a universalist. Although you're not a committed universalist, from what I've gathered, so you still sure hope for you. I'm a tentative universalist. We can, <laughs> we can say that. Uh, yeah. So the movie theater comment uh -huh. is a reference to. So I'm non-denominational, right? I go to a non-denominational church, um, sometimes a Baptist church. But uh, it, the joke is that it kind of looks like a concert, you know, these big screens and stuff like that. And we were comparing churches and everyone else went to the, you know, Lutheran. They're very, very traditional looking stained glass with an altar kind of kind of churches. And so uh, it was just kind of mocking that whole contemporary niche look to it, which is kind of funny. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's where that, that sentiment is coming from. But so, yeah, so guys, you, you know, if you like the show and you want to continue to support the show or do whatever you, you want to do, hit the subscribe button. That's all you have to do. Me and Caleb are trying to take this to another level, as you saw in the little video that was made. Uh, so, yeah, man, you, you know, come on here, grill Caleb. Uh, also, for the contest, guys, I do want to put out my email. Uh, all you have to do is send me a email to this to this uh, email address uh, with the logo attached, and you will get a prize. I am going to send you something. So once that is done, I will ask for your address, and you can share it with me because it will be in my private email, so you don't have to worry about it being live on here. And I will send you something. So let us know, uh, and if you want to take part in this artistic uh, endeavor, uh, send me an email. But yeah, so Caleb, uh, what made you want to uh, join the show? Uh, well, I think the very first time I joined the show in the debate with James, the honest atheist, was uh, David Palman had reached out to me. And I had talked to Palman probably about a month or two beforehand about 
I don't I, we were in the same theology group, I think, on Facebook. I don't remember the first time I interacted with him. But I was like, oh, yeah, he seems like a smart guy. He's very opinionated, <laughs> very outspoken. About it. And so am I. So, like, what a great combination. So he's like, hey, do you want to come on our show? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I always wanted yeah. to, to do YouTube. Never had the time. I was more of a writer than a, than a video person. So I, I never really edited my own stuff. But, you know, podcasts are a great idea, and I like talking. So it's like I can, I can talk for a while. So, you know, I think it's a good environment to, to do that. But yeah, it kind I mean of took off since. Yeah, and, and you know you are a political science guy, so uh, right. you probably already disagree a lot with Titus. So we're gonna bring him <laughs> on here okay. and let him say hi. What's up, Titus? Hey guys, what's going on? What's going Nothing on? much. As you can see, we got our new co-host here, uh, Paul. But he's actually in a debate. He wanted to come on, but I'm leaving. I'm leaving it open. I'm leaving this this podcast running for a little bit. We're gonna talk about theology and be geeks. So I'm calling ourselves the Theo Geeks tonight. So we're going to talk about anything you all want to. Um, also, you know, you can grill Caleb if you'd like. So Titus, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. What's up with the logo change? That's sacred, man. I made that logo. Yep. And you know what? It's time for a change. You know, one of the biggest things for YouTube <laughs> is, they, is, is people like to see change. They like to see new content. They like to see new things so i thought i'd start with the logo and then move on to the name what do you think <laughs> i keep thinking it is true you need to change that name that is the it is a really <laughs> odd name <laughs> yeah and it's long it, it's too much for people to type so uh so, caleb i'm a little worried about this comment here it says caleb attends an ugly fake church building it's so bad caleb the radically skeptic lib and then this one he also went to the creation museum and loved it Caleb, okay. wow! Explain yourself, sir. All of these commenters who I know want to want to stick behind their keyboards instead of doing this face to face like a man, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> here's, but, here's, uh, here's the link for face to face, gentlemen, in the super chat. So uh, yeah, I explained the, the church thing with the uh, with the building. The, the comment about being skeptical. So there's a lot of backstory to that, but in the group that I'm in, we have a lot of um, very conservative um mcgroovian kind of resurrection people and i i take a little bit more of a moderate stance and they don't like that that i'm not an echo chamber let's say i don't even disagree with their conclusions i just try to i try to play devil's advocate and be as fair as i can to the other side and uh they just want they just want to sometimes wring my neck and be like why don't you just say this and this why you have to be so so critical but i don't know i think that's a virtue but i i, I kind of find it funny how it annoys them it's it's almost a joke at this point of me disagreeing just for the sake of disagreeing so right on so you guys just got called out that are in the in the chat to come on uh titus i'm gonna let you take it away man you want to grill this guy yeah i'm just curious so all i know about you as a universal is that you're a universalist or it's a hopeful universalist because we had that <laughs> debate slash discussion a couple months ago anyone um, who hasn't seen the video by the way go check it out because that, that's on the channel as well and apparently you're into high church is that what i was hearing earlier in the show high church hey daniel's here no, it was a – so to give context, it was a non-denominational church that they were calling a movie theater, including the one who's right here, by the way, because uh, wow. of the, the way it looks is like, a, you know, with the screens and stuff, whereas most of them had very traditional Lutheran or, you oh, know, stained glass churches where it's all that, which is very beautiful architecturally speaking. But yeah, um, I won't use the word boring, but, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll have whatever Im implications you want. I actually don't even know which church David Russell goes to, so maybe <laughs> that's – Fair as well. If we're gonna, I go to an Amish church because <laughs> I, I I took after Titus after uh, he left the show. Yeah. I feel like many nights I became a pacifist to too. Amish people, but <laughs> I am curious about I'm curious about your uh, political science studies. So, like, what what's motivating you to get into politics? It's kind of funny. So, I was I went into college 2017. You know, right after the 2016 election, which turned most people off to politics. But I thought that was just a very exciting time because it was being more like I think talked about than any other election and stuff like that. So that just got me really interested in politics. And I, and I've had my views change throughout college to certain degrees, some, some to certain degrees and some I'm even more confident on than I was before. So it's a, it's an interesting thing, but uh, yeah, I think politics is very important. And um, I think there's ways to go about it without, cause it's one of those controversial topics people don't like talking about, you know, religion and politics are the two things you shouldn't bring up on the dinner table. And those are my two favorite topics. So yeah. you have to, you have to get that settled. But, um, but yeah, so what, I just, what are your political do. leanings? Are you a libertarian like David Russell? Yes. He's an anarchist. 
<laughs> a Marxist. No According man, to Titus, he's a he's a Marxist here. So I'm not Marxist. <laughs> no, I'm de I'm definitely not a Marxist. Uh, no, I'm so I'm looking through my stuff right now. I've yeah, I'm I'm a classical liberal or libertarian, however you want to say that. So you know, free market, um, economically conservative, socially. I won't use the word liberal, but socially, the government shouldn't really get involved if it's not hurting someone else. Your so. stimulus checks is what I'm hearing. I actually didn't get a stimulus check for the record. Okay, I, I was dedicated. I was not going to take their money. So. <laughs> I sent you a piece of paper. <laughs> I actually do, but just to verify, I have an anarchy hat and I have a taxationist theft you, hat. You so seriously didn't get? You seriously, out of principle, didn't get your stimulus check? Is that is that true? Dead serious. Dead serious. Dude, get the check and send it to me. Okay. <laughs> here's the thing. Okay, if you're against if you're against high taxes, just consider it a tax break it's the same thing <laughs> it's still the principle of the thing okay it's yeah. just this he, he wants the deficit <laughs> gone titus <laughs> you know? yeah, I know, right, yeah. all right have... so hey, hey hey guys hold on one second we got mr lowry here i want to let him come in because you know he's here and we got to let him talk a little bit man so mr lowry uh how you doing man doing Go all right on. i couldn't i couldn't let caleb get away with uh calling me out uh from behind sitting behind a uh, you know, the keyboard. Um, yeah. He's okay. But, He's from California. So, you know, they're all heathens over there anyway. So it's, yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. I, I was going to be seceded soon. So they wouldn't even be part of the United States after a while. So, oh yeah. All right. yeah. <laughs> well, we have this crazy runoff going on and, uh, one of the candidates literally just did an ad with a uh, grizzly bear in it. And he's, his whole thing is that he's the beast for our state. So it's going to be mm. pretty interesting here the next uh, couple months, I think. So. You know, Caitlyn really? Jenner and stuff running there too. It's all just all fun. Oh, it, it, it's really um, growing up in a conservative family for California, which is probably a liberal family in most of uh, the red states, right? Right, yeah. Um, it's still very interesting, just the politics of, of it all. Because um, uh, there's still this tendency to try and, uh, you know, want to be, uh, uh, I guess, non uh conformist or something like that contrarian and stuff like that but it's very interesting uh how politics has sort of evolved um in our state and especially growing up in the shadow of john MacArthur's uh seminary and how that affects your uh, theology so oh, i'm sorry it's okay i have al moeller's seminary in my city so what, you know it, what are you talking about you live in the shadow of uh ken ham that's true. Although the creation museum is not in my city it's probably an hour away from where i live but as close enough yeah that's also explains the comment for the record of the he's been to the creation museum and loves it. okay that was first of all i was probably in middle school and maybe younger than that the first time and it is a fun experience okay so whether or not you agree with it it's definitely interesting to see i'm not advocating for it i don't agree with it at all if we can get ben stanhope on the show which i think he says he might do it later on uh david but uh right we can talk about that so he's definitely the person to talk well, I am right totally on. committed to uh, flying out there and uh, doing a full exegetical review with you. I'll one. join you. If, if you ever do, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll join you. You're making an event, guys. PRA event. Well, I mean, David's yeah. in Virginia. He's not too far. He could no, I'm not. Drive out. Yeah, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about uh, taking the family there one day and, and just <laughs> oh, no. poking my nose around and letting my kids get lost. And, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see, <laughs> but yeah, I, I do. I have the Bible Museum over here, so I'm really, I'm really psyched on that, man. You know, I went up there. I spent like two hours in the uh, Bible room. Basically, it's it's basically they got all these old Bibles there, man. They got wow, Martin Luther, yeah. one of Martin Luther's Bibles. They've got uh, 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 they got some some of the Dead Sea Scrolls there. They've got a whole bunch of stuff there, man. It, it's amazing. And just to see something that was signed by Martin Luther was pretty cool. To see something that was signed by other people. I mean, it was just, you know, really, really cool to see. And then, like, to see how the copying process and the and the chairs they used and, you know, kind of like the method they used and stuff like that. Just being able to walk around. And, and they uh, another thing they had there, they had, a, they had a piece of the second temple there. You know, oh, wow. like a piece of the the broken uh, uh, temple. So I got to touch that and just like to they they allow you to touch it. So like I touched it and just like to know that that like Jesus' voice echoed off that pillar was like 
it was moving, man. It almost brought tears to my eyes, man. I, I, I loved it, man. I, I love that museum, man. Just to go there and see the ancient Greeks. They had P-175 there, which was really cool. So uh, when you see, like, one that was, you, you know, it's like the end of Luke, first part of John, and you see that, you know, the text hasn't changed, like, the guys knocking on your door tell you, you know, it, it's actually the same. And I, I even showed it to my kids and I read it for my kids. And I was like, now, what does it say in your Bible? You know, and they're like, yeah. So I was like, what are you going to do when someone tells you it's not the same? So. Oh, part early. Yeah, so. I have to write <laughs> doing all that. But anyways, yeah. So, um, yeah, we got a question for you, Caleb. Just rolled in. Um, what do you think about the wars of the Middle East? They shouldn't be going on, and I'm not a big fan of them. So, actually, Daniel and I talked about this the other day, which is kind of funny. But I would personally prefer, and I know that it gets you know very complicated. But I'm generally not an interventionist at all, unless we're directly attacked. So, uh, I I think we've been in the Middle East for what 20 years now, and uh, I would agree with taking troops out. I mean, granted, we have to do it in a safe way where you don't create ISIS again, because the first time we left it didn't end well. But I'm not a big fan of overthrowing dictators and getting involved in business that we're not. That doesn't directly affect us, and you know, dropping bombs on on Middle Eastern kids. So, uh, that that's generally my stance. So, what you're, right. you're, you're pro uh, Iraq War Two, but anti Iraq War One. Interesting. I'm not even a. I'm not even pro uh, for the Kuwait one in the '90s, the uh, Persian Gulf, because I know that's our oil. But you know, of course, I'm not saying I, should we even have oil reserves over that are owned by us. So, that's a, that that kind of gets into whole imperialism and you know all the all that long rabbit trail so do you do you want to debate uh christian anarchism at some point I, well i'm no longer an anarch well okay i guess i'm an anarchist no, i would be defending it i would be defending oh, it titus is a christian anarchist so oh, let, yeah let's okay. let's let titus chime in here on christian anarchy so it, it's it's kind of just a provocative term that i i don't identify fully with because i mean christian anarchists can cover a lot of ground you know i i'm the sort of christian anarchist who actually believes that romans 13 is inspired but the way that i would understand romans 13 is that the government is in rebellion to god specifically to jesus instructions in the sermon on the mount to love your enemies um, by using violence and coercion nevertheless god still uses them for his sovereign purposes in the same way that he used Pilate to get jesus crucified in the same way that like he used Assyria to punish Israel and then punished Assyria for punishing Israel, you know, so you, you can only punish someone if they're doing something that's sinful, right? So even when people do sinful things, God can still use them. So I, I think that all human governments are under rebellion or they're in rebellion against God. And nevertheless, God still uses them to control, you know, the chaos of the planet. But really, it's the, the foundation is is my conviction of Christian nonviolence. So if you understand the gospel in terms of like Jesus is king as like the central core tenant of the gospel, the announcement that that the rule and reign of God is coming back to earth, it actually is has some very serious political implications that this is an actual real nation that we're citizens of. Um, and that's that's core to the gospel. And then we would understand allegiance to other nations as a form of treason. Not that everyone who's like voting and in, 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 in the police force is going to hell because of treason. I mean, I, there's obviously like a, a spectrum of, you know, we're, we're all wrong at some point. So it's a pretty <laughs> radical view. What'd you say? I mean, Westboro Baptist Church thinks all soldiers are going to hell. But, you know, <laughs> if, you're gonna, if you want to play that game. But, uh, yeah, no, I think there's a lot. I would agree with a lot of what you said there. I think the whole nonviolence is very important to me. I mean, that's the whole foundation of of political libertarianism is the idea of, uh, you know, the non-aggression principle. Oh, hi, Dale. Uh, and so, and you know, Dale's Canadian, so it's okay. We're talking about American Is politics. Dale from it's Skeptics and Seekers? This is, is Dale from Skeptics and Seekers. It is, although I'm from Real Seeker. Yes, Real Seekers yeah, ministry. But, uh, yeah, from former SNS fame. So. <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah, I forgot what it was. But yeah, but I, I would agree with Titus on the whole nonviolence thing. That's an interesting interpretation of Romans 13. I kind of thought the same thing with um, the verse about give to, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. I think he's saying that, yes, you do owe authority to the government, but the government is also doing an immoral thing by collecting taxes from you in the first place. So it's kind of a, 
it's like if you're supposed to obey your parents, but your parents are being immoral if they're commanding you to do certain things that are immoral. So I think you could you could take double entendres there. But I do think it's funny how the anarchist is telling me to take money from the government. But okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with Romans 13, I, I lay it out as a logical syllogism. So if you go back to Romans 12, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Um, then, then, you know, Paul echoes the Sermon on the Mount there, you know, return good for evil. And then Romans 13, it says um, that, that, that the government is an avenger, and it's mm. the same Greek word used there. So premise one, Christians are not supposed to use vengeance like this. Premise two, the government uses this sort of vengeance. Conclusion, Christians should not be in the government. Um, I, don't, I don't see how anyone can get out of that airtight syllogism. So you're saying that I'm doing something by, by going into politics that I'm being a part of that? Well, well, you said, I mean, you, you said you're a pacifist or are you a hard pacifist or like, are you just a peace lover who thinks that in certain situations it's still right to use violence or lethal violence? Uh, in self-defense, I don't believe in violence for things that don't, I think if, if it's in a defensive way is in, you know, if someone's trying to rob you or murder you, then yes, the government should step in and say, you can't do that because there's basic rights we have for life, liberty, and property, right? That, you know, it's the idea is you're free to do what you want as long as you don't infringe on the rights of someone else against their will. So, consent. If, if I give you money for a service, that's fine. If I force you to give me money, then that's immoral, which is why I think taxation is morally questionable as well, um, unless it's for specific things like police and stuff like that, where everyone will use it. Um, but yeah, I think with wars, I'm I'm a pacifist unless it's self defense because it's if it's self defense, then I think that's reasonable. But I would never say that. Yeah, if we if another Pearl Harbor happens, we should do nothing. I I, I wouldn't go that far, um, but I am. But I, mean, I do think that things like prostitution uh, should be legal. I think that drugs should be legal. That's a controversial one to end the war on drugs. Um, I would like to see like income tax gotten rid of and maybe go to a sales tax of some kind. Corporate tax gotten rid of. So lots of things on that, but. That, that's generally the views I have. I don't know if David Russell, I know he's a libertarian. I don't know how far he goes on, on stuff like that too. Because well, I'm a constitutional conservative, so okay. I'm more more that way. But yeah, I, I hear most of what you're saying. Um, let, let's, let's welcome Dale. Hey, Dale, what's going on, man? Hey, David, how's it going? I'm glad you could make it, man. I didn't think you would. I know I gave it to you last minute, but uh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah I almost welcome. missed it. I, I just saw an email saying, join this thing. I just clicked it. So. <laughs> Yeah. He didn't right even on, know you're joining. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Well, we, we welcome Caleb to the show, and I said, "Hey, well, let's grill Caleb. Let's let's uh, you know uh, see what he's all about. And, you know, introduce him the right way and do this formally." So, awesome. and because I'm a one trick pony, we started talking about pacifism. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's okay. Nice. Yeah. I like Titus, Titus, Titus likes to be wrong all the time. Every, so it's <laughs> every time I come on the show, we talk about this every bloody time. Yeah. <laughs> it's your favorite topic. We, hey, we all have our own pet uh, pet topics okay. and that sort of thing. So yeah. yeah, good stuff. Well, let me say that his politics is better than his view on hell. So there you go. I'll call, <laughs> that's a backhanded compliment, but there you go. Oh, okay. What's what is Titus's view on hell? No, it's because we had a debate about. Oh no, we can talk hell. Hey, we're here. We now. did hell last <laughs> time. We, 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 it don't matter. We can take. We can talk about anything. Uh, <laughs> this is the hell, open the hell of a topic, right? right? Yeah. Right. No, it was, it was Paulman last time was on here, and him and I got into it on hell. No, I'm a, I'm more of a tentative universalist, and he's uh, annihilationist, which. Uh, is what we were debating last time. Which, which, Dale, that means they're both wrong. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Russell, <laughs> Russell believes in eternal torture chambers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. But of course, of course, you would describe it like that because you don't understand the view. I thought you said you read The Great Divorce. I'm reading it at the moment. I'm going back. Oh, man. Okay. Hey, you know what's really cool, guys, is like C.S. Lewis's books, a lot of them are on YouTube for free now. So you can like listen to the audio books because the fifty year trademark, I guess, is is no no or copyright is no longer valid. So, yeah, I, I, I've listened to three C.S. Lewis books in the last like two weeks. <laughs> so I have a playlist of like C.S. Lewis doodle, just going over yeah, some of his yeah. um some of his talks and stuff like that that was delivered originally on BBC that had been animated. Um, oh yeah, I find those immensely helpful, especially. If you're familiar with any of like Planiga's style arguments, because it seems like Planiga is a much more there seems to be a uh, bit of inspiration in some of Planiga's popular um, writings, um, 
that seemed to be more of a thoroughgoing uh, of, uh, formulation of what Lewis was kind of t uh, angling at in some of his uh, writings. You know, if you say Plantiga three times, David Palman appears and... <laughs> so. or, or you might make him disappear. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know. It's I think it's just uncanny. Yeah, I don't know. Dale, did you have any uh, points you wanted to discuss? Or I know you just joined in, but you're, you, you're, you're a smart guy. You know a lot of stuff, so I'm sure you have something to talk about. Like a question or something. Yeah. It's a um, question or topic or, or comment or whatever. It's... it's yeah. Um... Yeah, well, well, I guess I so so yeah, I, I just finished my semester and that sort of thing. So I, one of the things I took a philosophy of aesthetics course. Um, so maybe I'll just throw it open to you guys. What do you guys think of the argument from beauty for the existence of God and that sort of thing? It's it's something that I've kind of ignored in the past, but I was forced to kind of look into it a little bit. So yeah, what do you guys make of that? So I'll let I'll let uh. uh... Uh, Caleb, go first, and then we'll take it to Titus and then Lowry, Mr. Lowry. I hope I'm saying that right, or otherwise I'm just going to call you a mighty duck. It's perfect. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've had my name is pronounced for like school assemblies and stuff like that. So thank you, Mr. Russell. Yeah. And by the way, Dale and Dale and uh, Daniel, I think have talked because they're both big shroudies for for those who don't know. If you get them talking about the shroud of Turin, you know we can do a whole thing. <laughs> Anyway, I'll answer Dale's question before we get off topic. So um, I will be honest, I have not looked into this a lot. Um, I have written on the moral argument before, but from my lay perception, it seems to me that the argument from beauty is essentially just a different version of the moral argument because I think moral value is essentially something that's beautiful, right? That's that's perceived as good. And so my, I guess my issue is I don't know how you'd be able to prove objective beauty unless you're going to appeal to like a properly basic belief which is what you could do for morality. But I guess to me, it seems more obvious that moral truths are real than it does to me that things are objectively beautiful. But again, if you're saying that human and human life is beautiful, that's fine. But I think it's just the moral argument at that point. So that, that's just what I would say. All right, Titus. Yeah, I don't really have any thoughts on this. I mean, I, I, I guess I could see a route that evolution could take us that we would start you know, viewing things as beautiful because it's advantageous for us to do so. Like, it's not advantageous for us to think that poop is beautiful because we can get diseases from it, right? So, I don't know, but but maybe that's an oversimplification of the rebuttal to that argument. I don't even know what the argument from beauty would be, so maybe you should lay that out first. You haven't been on the uh, internet enough, Titus, that you, you'd be uh, surprised let, what some people yeah. are into. So just... Yeah, I'll let Dale, Dale lay it out for us here in a minute. Uh, Mr. Lowry? Well, I trying to remember the uh, YouTube uh, video or the produ uh, YouTube uh, video maker that produced actually a pretty decent um, explanation of some of the arguments from beauty. I think it's uh, apologetics squared. Um, and he did sort of a response to uh, uh, godless engineer on the argument. And I thought that was kind of a good explanation of some of the angles of the argument um, and the different forms it could take for me. Um, especially being a composer by trade. Um, the argument from beauty is something that is very intriguing to me. Although I know like Caleb, he and I, it's kind of interesting that he compared it to the moral argument because I had a very similar um, uh, predilection about it. And in our my discussion with Caleb, I've sort of explained that uh, the argument for morality is not one of my favorite arguments. However, there is a way it could be formulated um, if one uh, like, someone like me who's coming from, you know, maybe contingency or cosmological arguments already has a concept of um, a maximally great being already being established by other arguments and then approaching the argument. At that point, as a theist, it seems like the argument is more probably true given um, once you already have that sort of established um, sort of theistic belief that it makes more sense that beauty would be real on a theistic framework than maybe not as a composer, I find that to be extremely interesting just from my work. Um, just It sort of forces me to ask, what exactly am I doing in my line of work, and how does that relate to who I am as a person, how I worship God, and vice versa. So I find the argument from beauty to, if not to be the most persuasive argument, to still be a very worthwhile sort of thought experiment, just going, what exactly am I, are we doing when we talk about music, art, and how it relates to God? 
So yeah, and, and you know, and I am going to bring up uh, properly basic beliefs here in a little bit, uh, especially hopefully Paulman does get a chance to come on because he is uh, debating right now. But uh, yeah, so the argument from Beauty Dale. Oh man, I didn't I didn't do much with it either like like you uh I, I it came up in college and uh like caleb said yeah like the moral argument i think the moral argument and there's a reason philosophers say the moral argument so strong is because uh more realism we're directly acquainted with as david Pullman would put it and caleb probably say it's properly basic but Pullman would say it was he's directly acquainted with it but <laughs> uh i would say that we're directly acquainted with the two because I'm more of a foundationalist myself. But uh, yeah, I think that, okay, so, so here's my view, view on beauty. It is, it is a lot like the moral argument and it is, uh, you know, um, we do experience it. And I think it's very powerful. It's a very powerful argument. Um, I mean, one of the first things that were attacked in this last century was beauty. And once beauty went, uh more relative and relativism came in next so without beauty everything becomes without beauty being real everything else becomes kind of subjective in that way so it the biggest mistake i think that i grew up with and, and grew up hearing was that beauty's in the be eye of the beholder no i think we can make a positive case for things being objectively uh, beautiful and i think that we can't forget that because once we lose sight of that it's easy for things like relativism to creep in because if there's nothing that's actually beautiful, then what's to say there's something that's not actually right or actually wrong? So if if beauty's relative, why not morals? You know, why not epistemic truths? You know, I mean, we're just giving way too much ground to the skeptic there. But yeah, Dale, lay it out for us, man, if you'd like. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and like I said, I, I'm new to it as well, so it's kind of just coming to grips with some of the positions that are out there and, and everything. And first of all, I just want to say, uh, yeah, it was great talking to you as well there, Titus. I know that you had to, you had to go, but um, you know, while it lasted, it was great. Um, but yeah, so in terms of the argument of beauty, so yeah, I think that there are various positions, right. That people give. So, you know, what, what is the nature of aesthetic values? Um, and obviously that's related to moral values. It's, it's all axiology, the, the study of values and that sort of thing. So they are related. Um, and many philosophers have done that. So there's the position, the non-cognitivist position. So like someone like Ayer would take an emotivist position. They'll say well, aesthetic values there uh, and, and judgments, they're just all emotions. We're just expressing our emotions. Um, other people, cognitivists would say, no, they're expressing actual truths and that sort of thing. It's actually true that this thing's beautiful or not. Um, and that divides up into, you know, subjectivists and that sort of thing who will say, it's, it's all a subjective experience or an attitude or something like that. Um, and then there's obviously the realist or objectivist position, um, which you guys were, were kind of advocating for and that sort of thing. There's something about the object itself that the object, it has the property of being beautiful or, or that sort of thing. Um, I sort of ended up in, in my little essay or whatever, I sort of ended up taking a position in between subjectivism and, and objectivism with aesthetic values. So it's a position known as dispositional realism. Um, so this was argued for by people like David Hume and, and stuff like that. But it, it says the object is necessary. It, it has a dispositional property, a property that disposes uh, a subject to having a certain proper aesthetic experience of some type. Um, so, it, you know, it's kind of a causal conception. The object causes a subjective experience or attitude towards this. This is beautiful or this is ugly. Um, but what, where I differ, David, where David Hume would try to argue that, okay, well, what, who is the person that's having this aesthetic experience? And they would say, well, it has to be a true ideal judge. And by that, he meant, you know, the art experts, the elites within the art community. Um, I kind of took his argument and then kind of said, no, actually the true judge is God. So aesthetic values are, are, and judgments are grounded in God. Um, he's the ideal judge. If an object, uh, if God is disposed from a certain object and caused to have a certain experience, um, aesthetic experience, then that that's what the nature of aesthetic values are. Um, 
so that was kind of in a nutshell how I got to God um, by using this disposition, dispositional realism and then just saying that actually there are problems with assuming that it's a bunch of human elites as the true judge. It's got to be God. So I don't know if that made sense or if I was just... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think that it comes, you, you know, what Lewis says about the moral argument, you know, and we shouldn't have, you know, a man can't have an idea of a straight or a crooked line unless he knows what a straight line is or am I, am I off on that? No. Nope. You know, and, and that's, a, and that's the same with beauty. How do we know, you know, ontologically that, I mean, this stuff's hitting us that way, you know? So I, I, I kind of take that that route as well uh, when I think about it. But yeah, I just learned about it like it was it was literally my last class. It was one of the uh, issues the the professor brought up, and it was really cool. I I didn't look into it as much as I'd like, but uh, I'm thinking that it has grave importance for us uh, because I do agree that once we let beauty go out the window, these things started having like a domino effect in western culture and you could see like the age of cool came in you know mm -hmm. uh the 1950s were famous for it in the states you know we had advertisements and that's when when you know this consumerism really popped up you know and these ideas you know popped up and then they started viewing the cosmos without god you know with the little green men and you know there's just a whole bunch of stuff that that ended up happening in the 60s reaped that harvest and we know what came after that you know, from the 60s, we got into psychedelic drugs in the 70s, you know, and or, or even more psychedelic drugs in the 70s and, and cocaine and so forth. And it just I think it, it really, you know, it, it really brought relativism to the forefront of uh, philosophical thought, at least in universities around the U.S. Gotcha. I don't know how it was in Canada, but <laughs> <laughs> I was, oh, was going to say it's kind of interesting. Um, because what you're sort of talking about, uh, David, sort of reminds me of some of the stuff I was studying as a composition major, the deconstruction of uh, composition styles and the way it functions. Um, granted, I feel like um, the academy and stuff like that always feels like a couple of decades ahead of the popular culture. Um, yeah. So you end up from the turn of the century with the death of Mahler, and then you end up um, going through some really radical uh, phases um, and you end up with folks like John Cage in North America, right? So really, um, I think like probably the most iconic piece that most people might know of his would be like 433, which is four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. And really just asking the question, what is art, right? What is the role of performers? Um, is, you know, is it just sitting in a room? Is it purely in the heads of the um, audience members and performers in, uh, really pushing the bounds and sort of those questions and stuff like that. So I'd be really kind of interested in seeing like a historical and social analysis of um, philosophical views on beauty and how that might be reflected in other arts and then ultimately in popular culture too. That might be a place for future st um, personal study for me. So, Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Caleb, what else you got to say? Man, you got anything else for this? For the argument from beauty? Yeah. No, I would. Anything you want to add on? Yeah. I, again, I'm not overly. I, I from what Dale describes, I think that makes sense. I'm not competent enough and have not looked into enough to have an educated opinion. But it again seems to me that it's similar to the moral argument, which I, I unlike Daniel, really like the moral argument. So I have a whole chapter in the uh, theodicy book. The very first chapter is on the moral argument. So I. I think that, uh, and of course there's differences. I'm not saying it's identical, but I think the general sentiment that there is value in the world and that that value stems from an objective source is accurate. So that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. Yeah. Well, we're here to grill you. So you got to say more. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about other, yeah, we can talk about other stuff. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your universalism. You know, no, I'm just <laughs> is this what, is this like a grill Caleb show? Cause I know you yeah, said, it is, it is kind of a grill. Oh, Caleb show. Okay. I didn't even know yeah. that. All right. We can grill. We can grill Caleb today. No, I'm I, I dead serious. I, I should grill Dale for not have, having him have me on his show more. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> oh, you're, you're welcome anytime. Yeah. No, it's a joke. The last time I was on his show, we were interviewing Michael Lacona, and that went very well. Mm. But uh, it, it yeah. was an awesome show. Yeah, and I it know was. you like the um, the after show and stuff like that. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll bring you on sometime this spring, summer for sure. Uh, you can you can do spring. Well, I'm I'm working on. Uh, 
this very large book on uh well it's 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 about the resurrection but it's tying it into contemporary miracles and visions of jesus so mm -hmm. if you want to talk i know you've had shows where you talk about some some similar stuff like that and of course daniel i know has looked into that a little bit more too but uh I don't know, maybe you can wait closer to when it comes out or, or whatever, sure. but it doesn't matter to me. But yeah, um, yeah, not to plug in my own stuff there. But <laughs> well, you know, uh, with, with what you said about the moral argument and the argument for beauty, we understand that you're not a philosopher here. That's me and Dale's field. So I mean, I, yeah, that's I'm why we're divided on the side here because me and Dale believe in the real view of hell, uh, the one C.S. Lewis <laughs> taught us. And yeah, you don't. So. It's Dale and I, by the way, not me and Dale. Dale and I, yeah. Me and Dale. I, I'm from the South, bro. Come on, man. Virginia is not the way. Y'all, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, we were South. Trust me. This was Robert E. Leaves' home. <laughs> no, right. no, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone takes that well. Now. We have more presidents in this state than everybody else's state combined. No, I'm just sure. Kentucky was neutral during the Civil War, okay? So we're neither here nor there. We were like the cutoff point. And just like um, West Virginia and those hillbillies there too, so. Yeah. That's true, I, yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> being a Canadian here, so <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. You know, you know. You know, yeah. eh? <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, you know, we love, you know, our, we love our northern neighbors, yeah. especially yeah. their sports. Especially <laughs> yeah, <their> sport, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're They're not cap, my He's going to go see a hockey game while eating his poutine covered in maple syrup. And but he bumps into someone and says, oh, uh, I'm sorry about that. You know, the, yeah. the maple syrup that he got from the tree itself. Yes, from exactly. The tree itself next to the t uh, Tim Hortons. While he was know, yeah, next to the Tim Hortons. Yeah. You know, what's funny, Dale, is my, my grandfather was from Vermont. So <laughs> He actually huge on on uh, uh, the maple syrup, and he would always bring like the stuff from Vermont down to New Hampshire. It was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had like maple candies and stuff. And you all have Monopoly money too. The, the colors, but you know, but you know, it's even better than that is maple icing with bacon on a donut. Oh wow, that sounds oh, good. Oh, cronut is that what it's called or something? I think. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've never tried that. No, it's it's not for me. But yeah, I know what you're talking about for sure. Oh, come on, Dale. Everybody likes bacon. I like bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep it in its own uh, in its own place. You know? Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, have you, have you right. seen the donut burgers here? Although I haven't. I don't know if that's the thing here. But of course, it's America, so we have hamburgers where you'll have you'll have two donuts instead of buns, and they'll eat it, which is oh, wow. a lot. Yeah. Or yeah. Fried Oreos, fried everything if you're at a state fair. But yeah. Those, oh yeah, yeah. Although the fried onions are really good, like the big blooming onions. Oh, oh yeah, I'm a huge fan. Go of for it. those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah, let's 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 move on from this. Uh, Dale, yeah, the argument from beauty that was a great one to bring up, man. I, I appreciated that, and it gave me some some firepower to shoot at Caleb. So I appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, he also hasn't sent me any of his books yet. He was supposed to send me some so I could review them for him, but he he's he hasn't done it yet. I'm a little I, sent David, I sent David one. I know Palman. Palman gets it out of all people. I, you, I thought you said you bought the Resurrection one on Kindle. I did. Okay. I just need the. I want some paperback with some signatures, dude. Oh, I'll give I'll give it to you eventually. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm out of school now, so it's, I'll have more time, but. The reason I can't, you know, I'm reading Lewis, but of course I'm writing my own book, so that I'm going back and forth between. But I have to read stuff for that book and research, so it's a lot. Okay, it's yeah. I just I just got my books for this semester, so I'm actually I'm actually back in school now. I did yeah. take like the last month off. It was great, right. but yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I guess I could ask Dale, what do you? Because I know that I, I haven't listened to all of your uh, shows, but I believe mm -hmm. you did do one of the miracles one time. So I guess like, what's your um, opinion on stuff like that uh what's like the most compelling case you know of and, and stuff like that if that's a good question i don't know if he feels comfortable answering that but uh us uh, and sorry for for what to do with miracles i said like do you have like a particular um like case in mind that you think is like good evidence or do you um like just the general philosophy behind it or i, I guess which what's your opinion if someone asked you said hey what do you think about miracles and you know should i believe that they still happen today and stuff like that um, so, so yeah, I, I do lean in the direction that I do think that miracles, uh, like miracle healings, if that's what you mean, happen today and that sort of thing. Um, you know, obviously I'm a, a fan of Craig Keener's 
books on on this. I think it's one of the best. In case you've got you've got them, there you go. Uh, so so yeah, he he does a great job in laying out the cases, especially in the second volume. Um, I was kind of impressed, believe it or not, with Lords, even though it's a Catholic site and I'm I'm Protestant and that sort of thing. I I thought that they have certain cases where they've even got peer reviewed literature, and I, I kind of set up um links to some of the, the journal articles for some of those cases um and they have such strict criteria as to you know they do follow-ups years later they do investigations into the character of the person by interviewing people they they also have to have before and after medical documents and that sort of thing so um yeah i, I remember being impressed impressed with some of the cases uh from lords um also other cases where it's medically documented i think are obviously very powerful for skeptics and atheists um although for whatever reason david johnson wasn't convinced i don't know why but uh, <laughs> that man that man <laughs> you didn't give a reason or he just did the deal hunting of well i'm not convinced it's like well i'm sorry you're not convinced i don't know what else to say his, his so yeah so i think the name was ben godwin and i provided the extra oh yeah 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 um and his his answer to that was just yeah but those you know those can be uh mistakes or something maybe they put the wrong name so it was an x-ray of someone else and they put the wrong name on that was his answer to so much for evidence right yeah <laughs> actually you could you could technically go in and i mean if you wanted to really be if he was going to have this as a hypothesis we can go in and look and say okay are all the details of the legs similar right like are the links uh, you could you could scientifically tell whether or not that's some, the same leg or not i'm sure uh or you could just go ask the doctor or something or i mean the fact that he felt pain i, I think it's like obvious that you know the fact that his leg was already broken for the for the people watching this that just give context ben godwin had severely broken well, he actually didn't even break his leg his the bone came out of his leg he was in a biking accident three inches of his tibia laying on the on the ground next to him they put pins in his leg and said he's either gonna have to get an amputator or he's gonna be crippled his whole life um, they go to a prayer meeting. A woman has a vision of God putting the bone back in. He feels something. He goes back, and the leg is completely restored. You know, three inches are completely there. They take the pins out, um, and there's X-rays of it. And I actually have that in my book. I have the picture of the X-rays, which I'm sure Dale is familiar with, and some of the other ones. And I have Lords in there too, which he was talking about as well. So yeah, stuff like that. But uh, you know, if it was like one case, you could maybe do it. But I think it's the plethora. It's right. It's the amount. It's the fact that we have so many of these like this. That if if documents are being switched and mistaken this often, then I think we should be severely concerned with our healthcare system. If misdiagnoses are happening this often, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Fifty-five percent of American doctors. I don't know what the Canadian statistics are, but American doctors, over half of them, believe that they personally witnessed a miracle. So if all of those are mistaken or misdiagnoses, and oh my gosh, are we in trouble? Of, over half of our doctors apparently being incompetent or making it, that kind of mistake. It seems I, almost um, unfalsifiable at that point that any, mm -hmm. because you already have the testimonial evidence from the person that actually is claiming the miracle, right? Um, and then it depends on the case, right? But if the personal physician was looking over it and they're impressed by it, then you at least have, um, you know, sort of the basic eyewitness sort of accounts, right? And uh, yes, you can account for this by hoax or, um, misdiagnosis and stuff like that, right? At a priori, but once you start adding in the documentation, like the scientific um, literature um, or the actual just medical tests and stuff like that, it becomes more and more ad hoc to sort of appeal to either this is just a mistake or this is, um, you know, an element of fraud and stuff like that. It just has to get more and more involved. And mm -hmm. to me, it's kind of interesting that he went the route of just going, well, it must have been a mistake because uh, that's one route. The other route I've heard is just like, well, there's some unknown naturalistic cause that for whatever reason happened at this one point um, that doesn't right really- Right when the fur happened, just conveniently, yeah. 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 Right. It's, you know, guys, and you guys know this, it, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, it's volitional, you know? I mean, there's enough evidence out there, I, I think. Uh, and when, you, when you're presented with cases that really jeopardize that naturalism, you know, or that naturalistic position. Uh, people don't want to hear it, man, you know, and, and you'll get criticized for it regardless. You know, it's crazy. The issue yeah. is not the uh, actual data. It's uh, dealing with the philosophy or the, the uh, metaphysical worldview uh, disagreement. And that seems yeah. to be where the conversation needs to be had at that point. 
Yeah, and, and Dale, you brought up um, lords, as, cause I, and I know you're not Catholic and neither am I, but that kind of gets into the interesting question of like, where do we put our own like theological biases ahead? Because I have a, I don't know how much, I was gonna ask your opinion too, I don't know how much you know about Our Lady of Zaytun, which was this very famous Marian apparition in the 60s and early 70s. Plenty of photographs of it in Egypt, right? Uh, hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of witnesses see this light source. It was investigated by the government. They could not find any cause for the light, and there's been other explanations, but they all have issues. So it's like I can't explain how this happened or why. And, and but I, and I also admit as a Protestant, like I have that bias of not wanting to admit that that was Mary, because that would be very weird for my theology to think that Mary just appeared to these people. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's kind of like where do you let the evidence go? I mean, same thing with the. Uh, I talked to Dan about this too, like a Eucharist miracles, right? You, you have some cases where uh, communion wafer will start to bleed and become a heart, and it's been looked at by scientists, and some of the times it's published in journals. And it's like, what do I as a Protestant, I mean, granted, there are some Protestants who accept the real presence and stuff, but like, I don't believe that's so like, at what point does the evidence change my own worldview, I guess is the question. Yeah, that, well, that's that's what I was, believe it or not, I was just going to raise to you because you're writing oh, really? a book on it. Wow. And I, I don't <laughs> know cool. if it's already done, so like it may be worthless. But one thing that I, I think hasn't been done, and I've discussed this with Craig Keener, for example, so it, hmm. is I think we can develop, uh, so miracles happen for different reasons, right? Not obviously, you know, miracle healings, may, many times the reason is it's just a miracle of compassion. It, it's not attached to a religious message necessarily or that sort of thing. So what I would be interested in is seeing modern day miracle healings and developing a case from them that it's authenticating a given religious message. So, you know, for example, with that is, is that actually, is the miracle actually attesting to the truth of Catholicism or Christianity or Islam or something, or is it just a miracle of compassion? Someone, yeah, like that would be my recommendation for you is kind of develop a case from that front. And the most promising area that hasn't been um, explored, like Craig Keener just has like a brief section on it. Uh, but he mentions like what I call religious contests or power. I think he calls them power, power encounters. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where two, two religions are kind of facing off each other, like in, in an almost Old Testament battle and Christianity comes out on top showing that, yeah, this is the one inspired by God. I, I'd like to see more research maybe done with that to mm. kind of say Christianity is the the true religion. I don't know if you know. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. It's it's funny. I, I hate to spoil all of my research right now, but in the chapter on uh, miracles and other religions, I, I bring up examples that I don't know how to explain, and I, I'm saying maybe these could be legitimate. Um, but but the defense I give is that um, I think what's different is that in the case of Christianity, it's the only religion where miracles are being used as the primary cause for conversion, right? You see these huge growth rates in the third world um, from Pentecostalism because of miracles, where miracles in other religions don't typically cause conversion. They just happen and people accept them. But you don't see very large amounts of people converting to Hinduism or Islam because of miracles. It's usually because of birth rates. So if you're going to grant that some of these are from God, then it seems ironic that God seems to be doing these primarily for the case of converting people. And if you add in the uh, Visions of Jesus research, um, it's it's just interesting to me that Jesus is the only figure you see appear to Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists, but you don't see it the other way around, right? Why is Krishna not appearing to Christians more often? Why is Muhammad not appearing to Hindus more often. It just seems interesting to me that all of these are only going one way. So I think that's uh, I think that's also a case that needs to be brought up because when people talk about the resurrection, um, it, it's hard to deal with pluralism because someone can grant you, oh yeah, God rose you from the dead, but you know they might believe in other religions and think that that's legitimate too. So I think when you take this argument, you're not only defending like the resurrection and Jesus being alive, but you're defending christian exclusivism as well it, it's a it's an argument against pluralism which i think the resurrection the historical resurrection argument by itself doesn't really do as well so i think it's just an important element to add awesome yeah yeah I look, I look forward to seeing what you got when when it finally comes out and that sort of thing for sure then yeah right on gentlemen uh yeah so let's uh let's let caleb now give us another topic here because Oof. It's his turn, and I've been grilling him tonight and making fun of him at times and uh, let him get uh, blindsided with politics, but yeah. Gosh, you're, you're putting me on the spot here. Uh, I don't know. You all had an eschatology panel, right? I don't know if that's an appropriate topic for it, so that's been done to death. or 
I don't really know. Oh, no, we happened. haven't. We haven't done much on it. Yeah, we did have one. Um, okay. We did have a panel on that. Well, I'll bring up something specific, and then I'll get your all's thoughts on it. That I guess. Um, so in the book, I haven't. In one of my appendices, since I'm talking about visions, I have one account that ties into eschatology that I am curious. I don't really have an opinion about it, but it's interesting to me. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm personally a preterist. I think that Jesus was talking about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and that that was not the second coming, but the, the coming of the son of man, right? That a lot of the apocalyptic imagery is referring to the fall of Jerusalem. It's not this far off future event. Hold on, hold on. Before you go, before you go any further, okay. are you a partial preterist? Uh, a class, have- which is classical preterism you're going to have to define is, what you mean is there. jesus coming back at yes. some point yes. okay all yes. right then you're good you're not a heretic no no, no. well except for your universalism have. but <laughs> <laughs> no he will he, he will still come back but what i think is interesting is that and this doesn't get as discussed as i think as much as it should is that um josephus and tacitus tell us that during the fall of jerusalem and and I don't know if this is during 70 AD or 66 AD when it started, that there were chariots and soldiers seen in the clouds fighting, uh, like almost angelic soldiers. And that's just super interesting to me that that parallels the whole idea of the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. You know, in First Thessalonians, it talks about his army of angels, like I think literally in that case. So I don't know if that's jumping to conclusions and drawing parallels where there aren't any. But then you look at, um, I think Cassius Dio writes this, a couple weeks after that happened, Nero, who a lot of people think is the Antichrist in Revelation, um, while he is digging this um, canal, um, a trumpet sounds, and then the spirits of many people raise and are seen by Nero. And so when you compare that to Revelation, when it talks about the beast and the people he killed and executed and the sound of the trumpet, all that just, and, you know, the sound, this trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. All that just seems to me just to be really interesting how those coincide. So I don't, I want to know what your all's thoughts on, on stuff like that is, but I don't know if that was clear at all. A little bit. Yeah, we, I think I got the gist of it. Mr. Lowry, uh, go ahead. I'll let you go first. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it short because uh, my view on eschatology is very underdeveloped. Um, I'll just say it's very interesting. I am a little worried about uh, Caleb maybe uh, leaning uh, too much on a methodology that might be employed by like a Richard Carrier, finding parallels wherever. Oh no, don't do that. <laughs> well, with that said, on a more uh, sympathetic light, I, I think it's kind of interesting because it kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the work that Rob from Sentinel Apologetics has done um, with looking at sort of um, ancient Near Eastern or um, even like a, a pre, uh, prehist- prehistoric um, geology and finding correlates that could be sort of associated with uh, sort of a local interpretation of the flood. So it's kind of interesting. I, uh, that might be your next book, Caleb. So I'm, I'm, I'll defer to you on that. I will have a long list. I'm sure I'll get to it eventually. Right on. Dale, what you got for us, man? Have you done any looking into hell or uh, eschatology since the panel debate? I have not. So I've totally forgotten everything. I just kind of memorized stuff for the show and then um, – but I was I was trying my best because I, I am familiar with um, this argument from just uh, that um, Caleb was giving, but I've forgotten what the response is, and I'm like scanning over my old notes that I kept trying to find it, and it's not popping up. But um, yeah, so I, I guess um, I'll look for that, and I'll just send Caleb an email if I find it. But my basic position is, yeah, I, I don't think that a full preterist position is, is correct. I think that it is uh, the end times are forward looking, as even Caleb admits, Jesus, the second coming is in the future. It's going to come in the future. Um, and I think that the, the Bible seems to be indicating that um, the various events associated with the eschaton will be futuristic as well. They haven't already happened, um, you know, in terms of the the fourth thing, you know, like judgment coming and, and that sort of thing. I don't think it makes sense to say that, well, that was with the temple and, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I need more development with that once I scan over my notes, but uh, that's the best I can do on the spot. Right on, right on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on the partial preterist train. Um, I do think that a lot of uh, what Jesus was talking about uh, was about the second temple getting destroyed. I do think that 
you know, Christ will come again at some point. Uh, I think it will be like a thief in the night. You know, I, I don't I don't see where, and I want to say dispensationalist. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say premillennial because my heart is actually broken as we speak about this because I found out Hugh Ross was actually pre, a classical premillennial on uh, on our last show, and you know how much I like Dr. Ross. But uh, I, I have a problem with a lot of the stuff that comes out of the whole left behind uh, mm -hmm. uh, generation there, you know, the whole idea that these temple sacrifices will, will be reinstituted and, and, you know, all these guys trying to figure out what's going to happen. I think it really undercuts the fact that Christ was like, it's going to be like a thief in the night. It's going to come out of nowhere, you know, and, I don't see Jesus contradicting himself by, you know, saying, "Hey, no, I don't. No man knows this day or hour. It's going to be like a thief in the night." And then go ahead and say, "Well, there's going to be this moons that or stars that fall from heaven and blah blah blah." You know, and just go on this long tirade. No, I think he was speaking to a specific issue that was going to happen in the near future. And you know, prophecy is one of the biggest things that that skeptics or anybody secular will try to use to disprove the bible you know and for me that's a big big red flag you know on on them but back to ex eschatology uh so yeah my view is is the same on that i'm a partial preterist i do lean more towards like the kingdom being the church age so that would uh be uh amillennial in a way so I don't think there'll be a, a thousand year reign, you know, maybe uh, if we're lucky, you know, but I don't think there's going to be these unbelievers living with the believers. It, it just, to me, none of that really makes sense to me. And I know people will jump back and say, well, if the Bible says it, well, that's how you're reading it. And maybe you got it wrong. <laughs> so uh, I, the way I look at it and here's my points, you know, so but, and I'll just back you up. So I'm, I took the all millenniast uh, perspective as well. So good to know I'm right. Uh, David Russell agrees with me. Yeah. So. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll third that just because I'm pretty sure that's the uh, default position within my branch of Lutheranism. So, yeah. you know, I read a lot of Sam Storms. I read some of Sam Storms. It's been a while, guys. Uh, but what really pushed me over the edge was Hank Hanegraaff's apoc Apocalypse Code. You know, I, I he was like one of the first guys that got me into apologetics, and I was really into the end times. And this was like, I mean, this is over 15 years ago now. Um, but I read the Apocalypse Code, and I I was like, I, I got pushed over the edge there. I was like, man, this is this is really great stuff because he doesn't just walk through like end time stuff, but he also walks through with how to kind of like interpret the Bible. You know, he uses acronyms and it really helps out. Uh, but yeah, after that, I, you know, reading Sam Storms, a lot of his stuff on, on millennialism, I, I just find that the most compelling. But anyways, Dale, go ahead. I know you were saying something there. Um. Oh, well, no. I, yeah, no, I was just saying, yeah, I back, I back you up on that. And, and that's actually the classical view, right? Uh, tradition, The traditional view before the notions of a, a literal millennium came up or something, or the rapture view, that's a very recent view. Um, oh yeah, the rapture, I, absolutely. I don't think there's any rapture or anything like that, like left behind. Um, I yeah. always prefer the knowings uh, portrayal. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I, I do think we'll get caught up in the air, but it's gonna be a, the last day, <laughs> the uh, last day, you know, where everything record, changed. I think, for the record, Left Behind was a much better book than movie. Uh, I did like the books. The movie was something, um, not a good something, but you know, Nick Cage is. Are you? But was Kirk Cameron, Cameron, man, come Kirk on, Cameron, Kirk Cameron yeah, was amazing. Cameron. That's true. Kirk Cameron did it way before. Uh, oh, he he's been causing so much havoc in uh in my hometown. Oh no! Wait, does he live in the same hometown as you? Oh, Joe's same area, general area. Yeah. Well, welcome on Joseph Wooten. How you doing? Hi. Am I coming in good? Yeah, you're coming in perfect. Sweet. We're talking nice. about the end times. <laughs> yeah. Well, now we are. Yeah, yeah we're just that's what. Topics. That that's why I decided to come on. I was listening for mm -hmm. the whole time. I finally decided to jump on. Uh, right on, man. So, so what do you got for us, man? Okay, so I lean 
uh, partial prejudiced on millennialist view, but I wanted to bring up my uh, biggest grievance with this view, and it's that the, it three of the passages seem to connect the resurrection to um, Matthew 24 and to uh, the abomination of desolation. So in, in Matthew with the parable of the wheats and the tares where they grow up together and then they uh, are separated when they need to be harvested. The end of the age is described, the righteous are described as shining like the stars in the, uh, of the, the stars of the heavens. That's, comes from Daniel 12. That's about resurrection. So when it comes to the end of the age, when the elect are gathered by the angels from the four winds, that sounds like that should be a resurrection there of all the elect, which causes problems with partialism because that doesn't happen on that view. Also with Matthew, you can go to the last parable in Matthew 25. I don't think anyone reads that as being during 70 AD, but that's still in that same, the all the discourse in that book. Anyways. So that seems to mess with that view a little bit. Uh, this would be strange why that's there. The end of the age is supposed to be 70 AD. Why is this in times prophecy here? Um, I guess I guess up there I'll bring up something else. Yeah, you know, I want to, I want to, well, let's tackle that a little bit because, I mean, I don't have it up right now and, I, and I'm looking for, for it. I, I've got to open up my apps and stuff, but if, if, yeah. if I'm understanding you right, yeah, I, yeah, I'd have to look it up. I'd have to actually read the entire scripture. I don't want to give a false, false view here, but, uh, with the abomination of desolation, you know, and the harken back to Daniel, I think that was fulfilled too uh, with Antiochus Epiphanes when he set up Jupiter in the temple. And then when it comes to 70 AD, they killed all the, the priests and threw their blood on the altar. So uh, I don't know if that correlates at all or has any, any bearing on that. But uh, yeah, I, maybe I'm not understanding you right. Uh, Caleb, what do you think? Well, I would agree with the whole Antiochus thing. Um, if he's talking about the Jesus describing the resurrection and equating that with Matthew, that, that I actually think is an interesting point. That's the hardest, I think, objection to the preterist view is that it doesn't seem like he's talking about two different events when you read it. It seems like it's about the same thing. So on the one hand, you get a lot of the imagery for the temple, but on the other hand, you get a lot of, you know, the angels will come and gather the elect and the dead will be risen. And you're like, well, that did that assumingly didn't happen in you know 70 AD unless you're going to take what I said and assume that some dead people were raised in front of Nero but um, even if we don't grant that I have thought of and I don't know if this this might be somewhat controversial but part of me wants to think that maybe Jesus was intentionally vague with his descriptions so that it would motivate people to go out and spread the gospel more because if if they knew that he wasn't going to come back in what 2,000 years plus um, that might have affected it and so I can understand uh, you know Paul thought I think Paul thought Jesus was going to come back his lifetime. Peter did in Second Peter. So I think that their insistence that the end of time was near may have bolstered up their um, their willingness to evangelize the people. So um, some people might not like that view because it implies that it was misleading. But what was that? Oh, I thought I heard no. something. You heard, you heard somebody's uh, uh, mic that wasn't muted. Continue. <laughs> No, I was pretty much done with that, but that's just, okay. yeah, that was, I was pretty much done. All right. Anybody else? I'm looking up the scripture, so I can't go. Caleb, take it away. Joseph, uh, what do you have to say to Caleb's uh, Nero uh, objection there? Well, I find his explanation that Jesus was intentionally vague to help the gospel spread interesting, though. That's reading a lot back into the scripture that I wouldn't grant. Now, you'll have to go over the Nero part again because I missed that part. So it was just a hypothetical. And again, this might be making parallels where there isn't one. But if you're comparing the Josephus passage where um, when the temple was falling or right before the temple fell, there were soldiers and 
things seen in the clouds, right? That's similar to what Paul describes in First Thessalonians and Jesus when he talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. So some people think that could be a fulfillment of that. With Nero, um, I believe it's in Cassius Dio or one of the Roman historians, talks about a few weeks after that event happened, when they were digging a canal, you hear this trumpet sound, right? Which is like First Corinthians 15, the trumpet will sound, and these spirits appear in front of Nero. And that's a weird detail to throw in, uh, but if you connect that with like um, not only First Corinthians 15, but with Revelation when it talks about the souls in heaven who had been killed by the beast, because typically Nero is associated with the with the beast in Revelation, right? Um, you know, being killed by the beast and waking up in heaven and saying, you know, when are we going to be raised, Lord, and all that stuff. So I think you just get a lot of these similar ideas of, you know, Nero seeing these dead people that he executed and a trumpet sounding and this happening at the same time the temple is falling. It, one could draw connections there and say maybe this is like a partial um, fulfillment, kind of like how Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was raised, even though they thought the resurrection was only going to happen at the end of time, uh, and maybe some other people were prematurely raised, but the final resurrection won't happen until you know the end when he returns once and for all. So that was just a, a, a theory. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not married to it or anything like that, but I just think it's an interesting detail that doesn't get a lot of attention. Okay, so yeah, I, was, I, I just looked it over too. Um, I think it's part of this whole apocalyptic literature that Jesus is giving. Uh, the, I mean, right before verse 31 was, you know, the, the Son of Man coming on the clouds, which is always that Old Testament judgment language. And Daniel and then, 7, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, he, he will send forth his angels, his messengers with a great trumpet, and they will gather together as elect from the four winds. I, I just think that's that's still part of that poetry that's going on there. And there's probably, there's obviously a deeper meaning there that I would like to look further into myself. So, Dale, you got anything? I can always count on you. <laughs> um, well, eschatology, again, is not my subject, but um, yeah, like I got that. I think that there there are some parallels. Yeah, like obviously Antiochus is what it's talking about there. And, and um, I can see, I've heard, uh, what? No, that was, that, was, that was my fault. Go ahead, keep continuing. Oh, no. um, yeah, and I, I can see some links and that sort of thing with Nero, what like Caleb's trying to say. Um, I, I think he's kind of, I don't know. I think he's kind of stretching it by saying like with the trumpet, um, no, no offense or anything like that. But yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think I buy that. I think the the trumpet's meant to be this call. It's heard worldwide and that sort of thing, and then it ushers in uh, the judgment from my readings and stuff like that. So I, I don't think, yeah, you can make that that connection based on that. Um, that's sort of my take there. It's a little bit strained. Yeah, that's that's fair. I again, I'm not like married to it i think it's just interesting theory that deserves more attention but it is certainly uh, intriguing to me nonetheless but i admit that there are parts of it that are a little bit ad hoc and the the rationalizations but yeah no i i get that cool all right gents well what's next caleb what would you like to talk about next i i do know what i want to talk about and i'm going to bring it up later but yeah you know, uh, heaven and hell Heaven and hell. Okay. Heaven and so, hell. So I, hell uh, um, I don't know. I mean, did Joseph, do you have anything in particular since you just joined, or did you just want to about eschatology? No. Oh. Yeah, I was just bringing up that uh, issue that I had with uh, my my prayers view. That's all. Okay. No, you're good. I, I'm yeah. have to stay here a while. Here a while. A while. No, yeah, it's fine. I didn't want. I know, we're just moving on to different topics. I just didn't want to isolate people who had other. Well, I don't know if this is going to be too big of a change, but I'm only saying this because I know we have Dale and Daniel both here, and so oh. it's gonna. Yeah, I, I guess I was going to ask. So I personally, I know that they're both big Shroud people who know way more about it than I do. I personally am still not entirely convinced that it's authentic. I lean towards it being fraudulent. So I guess if I'm going to ask both of them to give me like their best one minute case as to why I should lean it lean towards it being either supernatural or you know legitimate because right now I'm, I'm uncertain but I a little bit skeptical so whoever wants to take that I know they can both team up by the way uh, David I know that you've had Teddy on your show before you should do a panel when you have Dale Daniel and Teddy all on there talking about it because that would be <laughs> you can have a mask you can get have a mask on you know he, he, 
you can do all that stuff. So. The shroud panel, the ultimate shroud panel. Yes, the we'll ultimate shroud panel. Well, I know Daniel. Daniel disagrees with, with Habermas on some methodology stuff with the shroud, so he could talk. To, I'm sure he would like to talk to Habermas about that if he had the opportunity. But I'll let them talk. Awesome. Uh, so, so yeah, in terms of a one minute case, so, so yeah, my, my argument from the shroud, believe, believe it or not, I don't even care about the dating, even though the majority of my shroud shows are on the, the dating issue or the authenticity thing, it, that doesn't even matter to me at all. It's, it's all about, can we prove that the images are miraculous or, you know, their image formation was miraculous. So that's what I, that's my sort of focus there. Um, in terms of a one sentence, uh, that's really hard to do. I, I said I one minute doesn't be one sentence. I agree that would be. Okay. Yeah. Well, he's being facetious. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. okay. I'm too literalistic. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I would just say, um, look, so it, it um, in terms of my criteria for identifying a religious authenticating miracle, number one, we can prove it has certain physical chemical characteristics that have been scientifically proven beyond reasonable doubt. They're in the peer reviewed literature those physical chemical characteristics cannot be duplicated um, either in practice through actual experiments to try to duplicate them or even theoretically given the various artistic mechanisms hmm. that are possible to explain it or the naturalistic explanation so that would be direct contact or some kind of gas diffusion type mechanisms uh, none of these work uh, in explaining how the images could have been formed, uh, not even in theory. There's always a problem uh, in terms of the body images and the blood state images as well. Um, and then it, it's obviously the Shroud of Turin is within a religious context that is serving to authenticate, you know, Jesus died and uh, even his resurrection, given certain features of the body, there's body rigidity there. So, you know, um, that and then it it would have had to have left the images would have had to have been formed um before three days three days or less because the body's still in rigor mortis and there's not a sufficient amount of liquids body liquids on the shroud and that sort of thing so uh yeah that that's very basic but yeah that's my case in a nutshell now, now you talk about reproduction i Ha and I, I've talked to Daniel a little bit about this. I have read that uh, I think Garibashelli, which is name, has claimed that he was able to recreate it with like certain acid powders. So is that true, or how exactly would you respond so, to that? Uh, so uh, he's lying, but okay. <laughs> I will say this: he's produced the best Im reproduction images to date. So using an artistic method. Um, and I provide, I did an actual show, uh, I think it's part nine, my Shroud solo show part nine and 10, and I actually provide links so you can see the photos and that. It's nowhere close to what we have with the Shroud. Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's not a comparison, and that's just visually. Once you get into, okay, but does it actually reproduce the physical chemical features of the Shroud images? It doesn't, and Garlicelli himself admits this. He, I've got quotes from him saying, I didn't even come close to reproducing the shroud's three dimensionality or, or this, you know, it's superficiality or stuff like that. So, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just go a step further. Cause, um, uh, hold on, hold on. Caleb, you got the show for about five mics. I got to run real quick. There you right go. I, was, I was about to ask Daniel, just give me his spiel. Yeah. Like same question to Dale yeah. about the, the minute, the whole minute spiel. So he can go ahead and talk. Yeah. It, before I do that, I, I just want to go on with the Garla Shelley thing. I, there was an article recently published by Paolo de Lazzaro, um, uh, sort of uh, going against um, uh, Andrea Nicoletti, who uses a lot of Garla Shelley's research. And uh, de Lazzaro kind of goes after Garla Shelley because, um, in a re I guess, in a recent like conference in Italy, he sort of uh, went a step further from just saying, like, I can't reproduce some of these superficial, some of the superficiality or the microscopic um, image features. He denied, he got, he's gone further and denied their actual existence. Hmm. Um, and I like what De Lazzaro, uh, De Lazzaro sort of says, it's like, well, this seems to be a scientific method where he presupposes that it's a artistic method. He comes up with the best me um, technique he can, can come up with. And then anything that doesn't fit that, he just automatically denies. Well, it's unfalsifiable at that point, right? If it's, yeah. well, everything that disagrees with my theory is, is incorrect, so it can't be proven wrong. Yeah. Uh, another thing with 
with Garla Shelley. So, oh, sorry, sorry, Daniel, go ahead. I didn't mean oh, to. I was just going to say it's a nice parallel because I think it's even worse than what pro authenticists sort of say about the um, carbon 14 uh, testing. Because at least there's questions that have been asked in the literature about it. Um, uh, whereas Garla Shelley is, I mean, it's some of the most basic, um, some of the best attested data. And it's multiple that he has to just uh, deny its existence. It's not just one test. Yeah, I was just going to add, he, with Garla Shelley, um, I think Mark Antinacci makes this critique as well. Like he, he doesn't have one single coherent method in order to reproduce the features that he's claiming he's reproduced as well. He, he has to use different methods that aren't necessarily consistent with each other. Uh, and that wouldn't make sense with the Shroud of Turin, right? It's hmm. one process that made it, so. Gotcha. Wasn't there, uh, I don't want to get too, too niche here. So I'll, wasn't there a study in, I think, 2018 where they were testing the blood stains and people were acting as if that had debunked the stains in the Shroud? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but I don't know if Agar Vichelli did that yeah. study or. Yeah, he, he did. Um, Dale actually goes over in one of his oh, okay. um, Shroud podcasts. So that might be, a, and he also has a link to, um, the original paper and also some of the rebuttals. So that's where I actually started with that rebuttal. So yeah. thanks, uh, Dale. Well, I guess I will ask because I know both of you have seen it because I sent it to you. What are your all's opinions? Because Dale Allison recently wrote a book and he had a very short section on the Shroud. So I guess what are you? I, I showed Dale this in email. I didn't really know what he thought about it. So I guess Dale and Daniel, what, are you, what were your opinions on how Allison treated it? Uh, yeah, so so as you, as he said, and, and as you said in that email, so he's not really able to tackle the scientific mm -hmm. evidence, and, and that's what most matters to me. I, I don't even care if, and this is, I'm pretty much the only person who, who argues this, but even if the Shroud is medieval, okay, God did a medieval miracle authentic authenticating the religious message. If I can prove that those images are miraculous, that's, that's all that matters, regardless mm -hmm. of when it dates from. Uh, that said, I think that there is good evidence that suggests there, there's conclusive, pretty conclusive evidence that it's definitely centuries older than the medieval period. Um, so I, I kind of date it in two parts. It can go back to the sixth, can date it back to the sixth century with pretty good confidence, uh, and then we can date it. It probably dates, uh, and it goes back to Jesus and is authentic. But it's, in my opinion, it's a lot. The evidence is a lot weaker to establish that this um, might be a good point where i can sort of um give like my one minute spiel and sort of distinguish okay. how i differ from dale and how like uh how i sort of view the shroud um because i do like a lot of what dale does especially in his um he has his big write-up uh where he's basically going through image mechanisms and i think that's a very important sort of um uh part of the mystery of the shroud um is the question of what actually produced the image so for me, I don't want to defend any uh, one specific theory um, necessarily, because I do think to a certain extent, some of the data points are somewhat underdetermined. Um, uh, I've been really curious about some of John Jackson's theories, and he uh, makes some interesting predictions um, with radiation models. But unfortunately, some of the predictions that he makes that he, he's tried to um, trying to verify some of those uh, predictions um, or predicted features and stuff like that has proved somewhat difficult with the limited research. So what I try to do instead is to sort of ask major questions about what, from our starting points a priori, what could explain the shroud? So the two most popular would be it's a medieval artwork and B it's the authentic image of Christ. And then you can sort of ask different um, questions. Is it a natural image or is it um, a supernatural image? And what I try to do with, taking from Dale's sort of point of view is just sort of to argue from a historical context. Well, one, an artistic um, explanation is not tenable just from the various uh, image features. And then um, some of the models, the more and more ad hoc, they really become, I mean, yeah, people suggesting that um, for medieval photography is an option. That's, that's sort of the equivalent of like Greg Cabin's twin hypothesis within shroud studies. Um, but, for me, I want to sort of, uh, once I sort of look at that, not having to ask the question about um, dating, and just sort of go, if it is a medieval uh, product, it's far better explained by um, some of these energetic models that are quite frankly supernatural in nature, just to understate it, just simply because 
certain features such as uh, the lack of putrefaction or even some of the um, difficulties of like gas diffusion models to really explain the image features without having to add on corollaries such as like there was an earthquake within a rock hewn tomb. And then you just ask the question, who's crucifying people in the mid Middle Ages and saving their uh, burial shrouds after three days? It really becomes untenable to sort of hold to sort of a natural uh, naturalistic mechanism. So at that point, I want the skeptic to either go, well, it is the authentic burial shroud of Christ, or it's another just uh, medieval miracle that attests to Christianity at that point. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think the medieval idea is really interesting because you're saying maybe maybe it is medieval and the dating is correct, but God created this or put this image on there as a miracle. So that's definitely a very, I think, unique view. Um, it, it's definitely ad hoc, but it it's one view that doesn't require you to deny the um, any of the scientific data. So I guess the last thing I'll say on this topic before we move on is have uh, either of you looked, because I know this, this shroud of turn reminds me a little bit of um, uh, a relic called Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is allegedly an image created by the Virgin Mary in the 16th century. So uh, have either of you looked into, because apparently, and I have not read that much into it, that there's been studies on that, and it's like, oh, we can't explain how that appeared on there either. So have either of you looked into that extensively, and is it analogous to the shroud and anything like that? Uh, so, so I haven't looked into it extensively, but from what I have looked into it, yeah, it, it doesn't, it's not comparable in terms of the mm. key physical chemical features. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, com no comparison to the Shroud of Turin, what we have with that. that That's really what is key. I call them, I call this the minimal relevant features approach. So it's mm. comparable to, Gary did his minimal facts approach for the resurrection. I've got my minimal relevant features approach for the Shroud of Turin, so. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just add on um, my I haven't done a deep dive with the image of Guadalupe, although my Catholic friends are really pushing me to. I'm sure um, they are. Yeah. What I have sort of uncovered um, from folks within the shroud community is that um, even those that might be Catholic or, you know, pretty sympathetic to Catholics like Barry Schwartz, they're very adamant that the science is nowhere near what's been done on the shroud. Um, I know just for example, there has not been they're not even, my understanding is that they're not even uh, sure what material um, uh, the image is made on. And at that point, because one of the popular arguments that I've sort of heard about the uh, image is that it's been around too long um, for the material. Because um, I think it's allegedly made on agave. Yeah, However, I've heard there that haven't too. been any scientific tests to really confirm that. And one possibility is that it's actually on hemp, which my understanding is that hemp would last throughout the centuries um, mm. without fear of degradation. So that's just um, that's just some of the very basic shroud uh, data that was collected um, in the uh, previous century um, or uh, over the previous century it has just not been done on uh, the image of Guadalupe or even some of the other uh, alleged images of Christ, like the Manilep, uh, Manipello image and various others. Do you think that, oh, this will be the last question Joe has, do you think that there will ever be another chance where the Vatican will let people examine the actual strikes? I know that they look at pictures right now because they did this last study, in, I think, what, 88, 2002 maybe, but do you think that the Vatican will anytime soon allow like another full examination like the ones they did in the 70s? My understanding is with this Pope, that is not gonna not, happen. not gonna happen. Um, the, best opportunity that we probably had was with Ratzinger just because I know he was involved with some of the um, I think he was uh, the scientific one of the scientific advisors um, during the last uh, during the 80s so mm. you do it the same way Dale or yeah so so I actually have uh, I'm friends with uh, Barry Schwartz who who I had interviewed on the show he's one of the experts that was involved in that STIRP study in, in 1978 so yeah he, he's on the inside track and yeah the probably nothing soon um but i am hopeful at some point uh, i mean things are going to change and that sort of thing but yeah nothing soon is probably going to happen so yeah. unfortunately one thing just to add on is that every once in a while materials that were collected during the 78 investigation or uh, subsequent investigations do get experimented on um i know sometimes it could be a little bit controversial just uh due to some of the Vatican's policy of not acknowledging tests made on materials um, collected after. But um, I do believe in 2015, um, uh, scientists at the University of Padua began like looking at um, dust uh, samples that were collected um, 
uh, during the uh, 78 investigation. So every once in a while, um, some of those materials are still floating around and every once in a while, new studies will get published on them. It's um, just the scope is just very, you have to be very, it's very um, modest in scale, school, um, scale, excuse me. Gotcha. All right. Well, David Russell, we can move on to your final topic now if you want of heaven and hell. No, I was, I, well, okay. So what I was going to actually just say uh, was um, just about, you, you know, the, the whole idea of, of Christian fiction and the ideas of heaven and hell and uh, just stuff like that. I mean, we don't have to go that route. I, I was mainly teasing you, but I, I did want to bring that up if, if we didn't, you know, have a, a topic there for the end. But I, I think we covered everything uh, and we had a good show, man. I, I think we're, we're good. So I guess you want to bring up anything else. Y'all yeah, can continue up. talking to Shroud. This is cool oh, stuff, man. Uh, here's another, I mean, since we're on relics, um, I mean, what's the one that the lady wiped his face, the blood blow on the face? I, I think I just read something recent that there was some sort of correlation between that and the shroud. Like there was something that, that they found that, that brought them together. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't, I don't know. I think what you're talking about is the Sudarium of Oviedo, um, in Spain, is that is that what you have? In mind? Uh, just the, whatever rag that the lady wiped his face off I with. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it could be that. I, I'm I was, not sure because I do well, know that there are some like images, like I know the veil of Veronica and stuff like that. That's sort of associated. Yeah, it's the veil of Veronica, right? It's the one oh, where she wiped his face. That's not and still around, is it? I, I think yeah, the veil of Veronica is lost, isn't it? Well, it's kind of a. It's hard to tell um, what's legendary material and what's not. Um, I'm not a. Personally, I'm not aware of. Um, I think one of the candidates is like the Manapello image, and again, uh, um, I'll, I'll just defer to Barry Schwartz's take on that image. Uh, it's a it's a bad painting. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, if you're talking about the Sudarium, there have been pretty rigorous scientific studies, which I think Dale could probably talk about a little bit better than I can. Yeah, I, I like those. So, th so this is um, a great evidence that proves the shroud is not medieval, and it. it dates back at least to the 6th century or even 5th century or earlier. Um, and this is basically the head cloth, right? So in the Gospel of John, you've got the multiple cloths, right? So this would have just covered Jesus' head. And it's got blood stains as well as certain, um, you know, body fluids on it and that sort of thing. And the the link to the Shroud of Turin is that, okay, well, the certain, the geometry of the blood, the body fluid patterns matches the, the shroud relative to its position it's in a different position but once you account for that it's the exact same size and that sort of thing so that's why there's a link to the shroud they'll say well these two cloths must have been in the same place and we can date as i said that 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 sudarium of oviedo we know its history it has a known historical provenance going all the way back to jerusalem um, you know, we have historical records uh, talking about it and that sort of thing as it spread west, fleeing Islam into Spain. Um, so that's huge, right? That that gets the shroud out of medieval Europe uh, and that sort of thing, and it links it to the Holy Land. Um, and, you know, obviously the shroud is, is meant to depict Jesus, whether you think it's an art thing or not. That's clearly Jesus of the Gospels and that sort of thing, died on the cross and that. Um so yeah, that, that's sort of the significance of this is um, if, if it's true that it's linked. There, there's also other studies, but I find them less conclusive based on the pollens, based on the dirt and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, the, the main thing is the link between these patterns. Uh, and it, that shows that these two things covered the same dead corpse. Going back to mm -hmm. Jerusalem. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's just interesting stuff. I mean, you, you, you look into these relics and, I mean, of course, you have what Notre Dame has the crown of thorns. I mean, of course, we don't know if that's there's really a lot of, There's the a lot of places thorns. that have the crown of thorns. I know, right? right. We, have three, we have three heads of John the Baptist in different churches. Yeah. I think we have a couple of foreskins, too. So. And India no. has part of uh, St. Thomas. Yeah. Actually, you know, it's, it's funny. I had a friend who did a mission trip to Cyprus. And he mm -hmm. said that while they were there, there was this Orthodox church that had a, um, uh, uh, not a monument, I'm trying to think of what the word is, a, a relic of where they said that they, they of where they thought Lazarus died. So they, apparently they say that Lazarus, when he was raised from the dead, went to Cyprus and then died there. 
and that was like there were little relic of that. It's like, oh wow, it's like, but that just shows you how common those things are, even though it's like the the evidence uh, for that is so. I did zero. But. I did some I did some research on Lazarus because I had to write a paper on Lazarus uh, and that whole whole scene in the gospel. And there's not one, but there's two spots. Uh, hmm. The one that was found in 800 AD was the one that was most compelling to me because when they were they weren't they weren't looking for lazarus right they weren't you know looking for a body or anything but when they came across the tomb or whatever all it said was uh lazarus friend of jesus uh however many days dead friend of jesus and and i thought i was like that's something that you know you, if you find something you just come across something like that that yeah. seems more authentic to me because we do was this grave at? from the tradition i can't remember off the top of my head I'd, I'd have to get my paper i might i might have the paper uh on my blog but uh yeah so it, it was really interesting and, and just diving into the different uh when i d dove into the different studies that was the most compelling to me mm. because uh you know it does make sense that you know he would go on to become a bishop mm -hmm. and that he would have to run away from you know for for fear of his life because he was somebody jesus raised from the dead i mean he, he went running around saying yeah i was raised by this guy i was dead for four days you know yeah. i mean so i could see that uh so yeah i said four days dead friend of jesus uh and you know it was just it was wild you know it was wild yeah so that and it was found it was found in 800 ad you know so this this had been you know built upon and so forth since then i don't know dale do you hear anything about that as well uh so no i'm pretty ignorant about the, the lazarus thing yeah the lazarus thing it's pretty cool it's you know i, I was really fascinated I, was, I think my my whole paper was on jesus raising lazarus and uh when i was looking into it the whole history of how the tomb was cut out because Lazarus would have had a, a floor tomb, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But all these tombs had what they called a soul window, right? Yeah. And this would have a window where the souls could go out after they couldn't recognize themselves anymore and they would go to wherever they went, sure, which yeah, obviously is huge reference to the idea of an afterlife, you know, because people had the whole notion well you know they didn't believe jews never believed in really an afterlife and stuff the like Sadu that the Sadducees did, a, the Pharisees did. The, the, yeah and, but here's the thing is like a lot more people because he ermin did a study on this and he said you know you could find annihilationists uh you know um you know and so forth a whole bunch of different different sects there and um but yeah i mean i think a soul window is is a pretty incredible evidence towards an afterlife yeah. you know um so you know with that said I, it was just really cool to see how they they had all that and how jesus would have raised him and how he would have came out of that tomb uh would almost be near impossible if it wasn't a miracle you know i mean well, it's I, just amazing i will say that i think that even though I'm skeptical of most medieval relics, I am actually most open to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre being authentic. I am probably 75% confident that that is authentic, which you know, that's the most famous site of where Jesus' tomb allegedly was that um, Constantine allegedly found. But there's actually quite a bit of archaeology to back it up. And what's really interesting is that the wall, that when they first found it, it was inside the walls of Jerusalem. And, and Jesus was crucified outside mm -hmm. of Jerusalem wall, so they said it couldn't be right. But when they kept digging right. it, they found that there was a second set of walls that it was actually on the outside of because the because Herod actually expanded the walls in 44 AD. And then, of course, they were destroyed after the fall of Jerusalem. So the whole point of if this is a late tradition in the time of Constantine, I'm impressed that they would be able to know where those walls were and get that right. Because it's not something you would know just hundreds of years later guessing. Right. And they they've dated funerary structures to about the first century. And it's the same kind of tomb that the Gospels describe. So. Yeah. All of that to me seems to imply that this probably was a place that was memorized and that they, they kept, they preserved the tradition for hundreds of years. So uh, I'm fairly confident that is legitimate. Yeah, I, I agree as well. I, I had to change my mind kind of thing. When I, years back when I went to Israel, I had the opportunity to go there. I had no clue. Oh, wow. The, the tour guy's like, oh, what do you, I wasn't even a Christian, but he's just like, what do you guys prefer, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the, uh, 
Protestant, like the Protestant yeah. garden, garden too. Yeah, garden seems not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's nothing. But uh, yeah, so I, I was like, oh, well, let's go to the garden tomb kind of thing. So thankfully, we went to both. Okay. Um, anyways, but but yeah, when I realized after the fact that no, actually, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is probably the real place. I was like, oh, whoa, um, that was crazy. I would I almost would have missed out on that. Um, and that research they just did, what was it, two, three years ago? Where they, uh, I think. Yeah, they, they opened up it for the first time in years and the people that went down there and the and whatever they they uh studied down there i mean it came back pretty pretty uh like some of the poems they said were were from the first century i mean all a bunch yeah. of weird stuff you yeah know? they dated it because before that point so the church has been destroyed several times during yeah the absolutely a very long history but they i from what i understand that they tested it and they were able because the thing when you see when you go in i i know that dale's been here i've only seen pictures so they would probably know, can attest this in person, but I, I've always wanted to go. You have this epicure, or I think it's called epicure, mm -hmm. and you have this like bench where it's like, oh, this is. He didn't actually lay on that one; it's underneath it because it's like cave. So theoretically, the bare place would have been underneath it. So the one you're seeing then is built, I think, during the medieval times. But I think they took that off, and they said like in the cave underneath it, there was a stone tablet that dated to around Constantine's time. So they know that this is at least a spot that Constantine preserved. And then underneath that, I think they dated a little bit later than that, uh, a little bit earlier than that. So it does match up with what was previously hypothesized, um, but it's definitely like a, a very old place. And there's no there's no good evidence against it. I, I, at best, you could say it's inconclusive, but I don't think there's any good reason to think that it's not other than just maybe lack of more. But there are plenty of Jerusalem archaeologists who do think it is. But on the contrary, nobody that I am aware of thinks the garden tomb is legitimate because the garden tomb, I think, almost certainly dates like the eighth, the eighth century BC, or it's way too old to be the yeah. legitimate tomb. Mm -hmm. So no, nobody yeah. takes that seriously but tourists. But it yeah, looks, yeah. Yeah. It it looks, looks cool. <laughs> it looks what, what you would imagine it to be, but it's almost certainly not the right one. Well, I was going to say, like, if you just listen to the reasoning behind the garden tomb versus uh, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the whole historical argument is just beyond um, weak in comparison, just because it seems much more like um, just reacting to how the site is today mm -hmm. um, rather than actually what's kind of interesting is that we're finding, you know, when we test uh, the garden tomb, we find it that it dates far too early. It's Whereas, way too uh, early. Yeah. It's way too early for it to be. Although when you look at like um, church of the Holy Sepulchre, we have that tradition at least identified within um, by the time of Constantine. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the weird coincidence of it being outside the wall, which doesn't seem like it would be the easiest to invent. Mm -hmm. Or if you're going to invent um, a location, you're going to, and you're working off the gospels, you're going to try and correlate it um, that way. And it just seems more and more natural. That this Actually, is you could date it to, so even though Constantine's the first one to venerate it, again, a lot of this is based off of Eusebius. So depending on how much you trust Eusebius here, he says that in um, the second century, I think like early second century, uh, Hadrian, the Roman emperor, had built a temple of, I think, Jupiter, one of the gods, on top of that spot intentionally because Christians were venerating it. And so it was almost a getting back at the Christians for that. And so when Constantine was first asking about uh, this plot, all of the bishops pointed to this temple and said, oh, it's underneath here. And he's like, oh, why would it be underneath here? But they but they knock it down and they ended up finding that there was this cave underneath there. So it is impressive that they would happen to get that right. They would happen to know that, yeah, there actually is a burial cave under this giant temple. Like, it, especially since that temple had been there for 200 years before Constantine was born. So that just seems very interesting that they would like guess that get that right if they were just guessing to say, oh, yeah, it's underneath that spot, right? So And you could thank his mother for that. Yeah, that's true. It was a lot of Constantine's yeah. mother. Yep, she was the one that was really interested in that. Yeah. I was going to say some of the traditions around his mother discovering it. I I, I think are the best argument against it, just because you might say. You that, think so? Well, uh, the way I've had it described to me is that well, we can't really take the uh, accounts too seriously because it's talking about like um I think I think she says that or in some of the accounts that she has like uh, either visions or somehow providentially selects the site or something like that. But mm. to me, that kind of. You kind of have to ignore a lot of the other um, data going in favor of it. Um, mm -hmm. it. It seems to me reasonable that in a political situation where you're, tr where maybe uh, it might not be so controversial in the immediate area, but if you're trying to convince, you know, the whole Christian or the whole soon-to-be Christian empire that this is where Jesus was um, laid to rest, that you might uh, try and invent some story to um, mm -hmm. 
Or there like, might be this sort of tendency. I think that they, they said that I have to read the passage, and I'm pretty sure Eusebius says the bishops are the ones who pointed her. Yeah. She may have had visions to confirm it, but it wasn't as if she had this vision. The bishops were like, oh, what, that's I thought she. I thought the whole that. visions for her was more towards the 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 cross itself. It might have been. That's what. It, yeah, I, I might be. Uh, I haven't. It's been a while since I've looked up the source. She was like, looking for relics. She was lo looking for uh, a piece of the original cross. She wanted to yeah, find yeah, that. Yeah. And those, I'm. Um, and I think that that she got she got the tomb because of the bishops, from what I remember. But I could, you know, it's been a while since yeah. I looked into yeah, it. Which, by the way, Dale, I know that um, when you had uh, letting me girl on your show, someone asked her about venerate. Why didn't they venerate the empty tomb? And I would have, and I, and I think she said that she didn't think the church venerated things back then. But I would just say I think that we have good reason to think the holy sepulchre is is legitimate. And I was a little bit confused when she said that because uh, I mean, even Jesus talks about people venerating the shrines of prophets. I mean, that was pretty common practice back then. He, uh, to decorate, you know, the the uh, tombs of David or the Maccabean martyrs and, and stuff like that. So I, I think we have every reason to think that they would have wanted to preserve the site and that they did preserve the site. So I didn't want to bring her yep. into that again. But you know. Fair enough. Take that, Lydia. Uh, no, don't, don't <laughs> take that. No, I'm joking. Her and, I, her and I have been talking a lot in corresponding. So she's she's nice. I, I, I like her. Oh, fine. Uh, yeah, she's just, awesome. We talk about the McGrews all the time in our chats, don't we, Daniel, with uh, other people and – it's it's really fun. Uh, uh, just just man up and defend the gospels, Caleb. <laughs> That's what they keep saying is I don't. They're like Caleb, just say the gospels are liable. Why you have to keep dancing around it and trying to to present yourself as as doing that? So yeah, yeah. That's just just to go back to the whole veneration, because um, I know that gets brought up by, I know uh, Crossley brings that up as like an argument against the empty tomb. Ludemann um, does too. Yeah, I just never found it all that persuasive, just simply because. You can take, like, if you think there's an absence of veneration, you can use that as an argument against the historicity of the empty tune and as an argument for it, like yeah. Tom Wright does. Or Allison, it's funny because Allison ranks all of the arguments for the empty tomb, and he puts that pretty low because he points that out. He's saying people on both sides say, aha, they didn't venerate it, meaning his bones weren't there, meaning it must have been empty. And on the other side, it's, aha, they didn't venerate it, meaning they didn't know where the body was. And so it wasn't, so it's like both sides seem to be trying to use that as a win point, which I don't think is persuasive either way but yeah I, I think what could be said is just that if it is venerated it's not a central part of christian um uh, it doesn't seem to be the most central aspect of uh their worship practices and how they commemorated um the death and resurrection early mm -hmm. on it seems uh, the way the hymns and the early creedal statements it's it seems to be much it, it doesn't seem to take quite as much precedent as one might expect um if it was a major facet hmm. but at the same time i think this is just a data point that's you know more or less irrelevant yeah yeah well guys you know i'm gonna bring it to a close now um caleb do you have anything to add you're gonna i sound like you're gonna say something uh i i would but i should have brought it up earlier with the lazarus thing so it'd be a bit tangential so i think we can just stop here all right. Well, guys, I appreciate y'all being on the show. Uh, Dale, always a pleasure. Mr. Lowley, it was great to meet you. Uh, again, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks for having us. And uh, great talking with you and uh, Caleb. And Daniel, finally, you're not just an email. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot scarier in person, I know. Yeah, it's a little bit different than just, here's this link to this article I found. Yeah. Check it out. Um, Dale, you should have Daniel on your show sometime about the Shroud. It'd be fun well, to I, listen I'm, to it. I'd be a little nervous about that because I know he has uh, Hugh Ferry um, watching every one of those shows. So. <laughs> so he's just judging what oh, he's saying. About yeah, yeah. He, oh, he's out there. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm bringing, as Daniel knows, uh, I'm hoping to have at least a couple new shows uh, trying a Shroud trial format um, hmm. where I'm going to bring on an actual medieval historian. And Hugh says he has a connection with an actual carbon-14 scientist. So, oh, you should um, get Joe Nickel on there and see, see if you can talk with him about it. Absolutely. Everyone's, everyone's favorite skeptic, and uh, Daniel loves him. James White of atheism. <laughs> the, the English. Well, we've dealt with the guys on skeptics and seekers, so we could probably deal with about any of the skeptics that are in the professional field of being skeptics. Right, yeah. uh, Thank you all for uh, letting me <laughs> really oh. that both you, that all, all three of you have done. So it's great uh, conversing with Dale. Nice to meet you, David. Finally, and um. Well, Caleb, I'll, I'll just see you in the ch group chats later tonight, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you for joining, though. And like some people in our group chat who were watching and didn't bother to join, so I won't name names. But Oh, he took off. 
<laughs> oh, he did. Yeah. Like, oh no. Oh, no, he's still here. Okay. If you want to, if you want to close out the show, David, we can stay and talk about some stuff for a little bit. I don't know if you're done, but if you want to. I know we're still live right now, but however you want to. All right. Well, well, no, no, yeah, we're gonna end the broadcast. We can chill out and talk a little bit, but yeah, guys, uh, again, thanks for coming on. Again, let me remind everybody that there's a contest going on. We are going to get a new logo and maybe a new name, but first a logo. Uh, yeah. So there's a prize involved. We're gonna send you something. Uh, we got some cool stuff going on in the works or in my studio, should I say? <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're, we'll be sending out prizes for that in, in July. Uh, but yeah, if you have an idea and if you're artistic, shoot me an email with uh, the attached logo that that you think we should have. And uh, yeah, if you like the show, subscribe. Uh, again, welcome Caleb to the show. Appreciate you uh, taking the the mantle for David. Uh, sorry that he didn't want to join us. He wanted to eat and feed his gut before he uh, would uh, actually hang out with us. But okay. uh, we got Dale uh, Glover uh, that came on instead, and he's a lot better than Pullman anyway. So, uh, yeah. Poor Pullman. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder. Yeah, well, well, he de he denies the virgin birth, so I think. Uh, oh, he's a heretic. Yes. And, and anyway. he's a Calvinist, right? So he's right. a presuppositionalist, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All of, all of the bad. But anyway. teeth right now. <laughs> well, everybody, this is uh, PRA. Uh, we got a lot more content coming up for you guys in the near future. Uh, so, yeah, have a good night.